rejoice and sing praises to our living King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our risen Savior Jesus. Sing it out. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. Lord of us, King of Kings. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. We pour the cross, make the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? sin, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Him, this is our God, this is who He is, He loves
Baptist, and this is Chloe Gibson. I want to ask any of Chloe's family or friends who are here today, if you would, to stand in support of her this morning. Uh, Chloe's a fourth grader. She goes to school over in Decatur. And it was back around Thanksgiving of last year that Chloe invited Jesus Christ into her life to be her Savior and Lord. And she comes today to testify to that through baptism. So, Chloe, it's because of your profession of faith in Jesus that I baptize you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Him in baptism and raised to walk. Chloe, we're very proud of you today, proud that you invited Jesus into your heart and that you testified to him through baptism today. So I want to pray for you, okay? Father, I thank you for this day, wonderful Easter day to celebrate your son. Thank you that we can celebrate Chloe today as she invited you into her life to be her Savior and Lord. I pray you'd help her to grow and continue to learn about you and become all that you want her to be for you in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 What a great way to begin our service this morning. We welcome you to First Den on this very special Easter Sunday as we celebrate our risen Savior and Lord. So great to have you with us this morning. If you're a guest with us, we would lo love to know about you being with us. You can go uh, and take the card that's located in the pew rack and just let us know, fill that card out. Or you can go to firstdenton.church and you can also fill it out online. There's a, that's a great website because it allows you to find the sermon notes and events and ministries and things that are going on here at First Denton. Just leave the card in your pew rack on the way out or in one of the boxes on the way out. We'd just love to know about you being here or you can fill it out, as I said, online. We're going to celebrate our risen Savior today, and we have already done that. We encourage you to continue to lean into this time of worship as we celebrate and sing and study God's Word together. Would you stand with me and find some folks around you and greet them this morning? <laughs>
You know, most people today, you and I included, want to believe that we are basically good. I mean, nobody wants to think they're a bad person, right? They want to think, hey, I'm a good person. You know, I'm kind to most people. I, uh, you know, I'm nice to most people I, I'm around. We want to think we're good. And that's kind of perpetuated by psychologists and counselors and a lot of religious leaders and even by country music. Any Luke Bryan fans in the house today? All right, Luke Bryan's got a song, Most People Are Good. And that's kind of the thought out there. We want to think we are. We want to think other people are. But Luke Bryan's wrong. Most people are not good. As a matter of fact, nobody, the Bible says, is good. All of us are sinful. All of us deal with guilt in our lives. How many remember Ann Landers? Ann Landers was an advice columnist uh, for many, many years. Millions of people wrote her letters. And she was asked one time, was there an overriding theme to the letters that you receive? Sometimes a thousand a day. And without hesitation, very quickly, she said, oh, yes, guilt. People ask, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel the way that I do? And maybe it's not so much guilt about actions they've taken, but just guilt about how they feel about themselves deep down inside. You see, while we want to think we're good, most people deep down realize we're not. There's just something there that gnaws at us, that makes us think something's not right. There's a guilt that's there. And that guilt is about, yes, our actions, but just about who we are who we are inside, who we are deep down within us. Paul has been telling us that for the first three chapters of the book of Romans. You have your Bible today, open Romans chapter number three. I've been telling you for weeks now, we're going to get to the good part. We're going to get to the good part. Well, we're not quite there yet today uh, as well. Uh, Actually, next week, I promise, next week we get to the good part. But over and over again, Paul has been telling us, all Jews, all Gentiles, which is everybody who's not a Jew, he's saying we're all guilty. All of us without exception have sin within our lives that keep us from being good, if you will. And the only way to remedy that, Paul's going to tell us, is through Jesus Christ and through his righteousness. We can't do it on our own. Uh, You can't make any difference on your own. The reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty. And the overriding theme of that guilt is sin. It's what's within us that we do that causes us to feel the way we do. Dr. Darrell Barnhouse was writing about this thing. He says, within each of us is that little boy who swears he hasn't been anywhere near the jelly jar. Uh, He's doing all that he can, crying and and trying to uh, portray his innocence, while all the while there's jelly on his shirt uh, that he can't see, but everybody else can That's kind of describes all of us. We want people to think that we're not guilty when we really are. Well, Paul's going to remind us of that again here in Romans chapter number three. Stand with me this morning in honor of God's word. We're going to read verses nine through 20, Romans chapter three, beginning verse nine and reading down through verse 20 today as we kind of continue this theme that he's had us in here for the last couple of chapters. Verse nine, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Father, we thank you for this wonderful Easter Sunday morning. We can come together and worship you. Thank you, Father, for the music of Easter and the joy it is to sing your praises and to be reminded of the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ made for us on the cross. But even more so, to be reminded of the resurrection on that first Sunday when he came out of the tomb to live forevermore. We're thankful for that today, Father. But Father, I pray you would teach us through your word today the difference that Easter makes and how we so need Easter in our lives to deal with the guilt, 
to deal with the sin that we so much want to get rid of in our lives. So, Father, teach us through your word today how Easter makes a difference. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, while we do think we're good, we want to be good, we realize our sinfulness, we realize our guilt, and we want to get rid of it. I mean, nobody wants to feel guilty, nobody wants to feel uh, that they're bad, but the only way to get rid of that guilt is to get rid of the sin, Paul says. And right here from the start, Paul says, we're all guilty without exception. He kind of, it's kind of like a courtroom here. Now, that's kind of what we have here. So take your outline, and let's go through kind of the stages that a prosecutor would take somebody who is accused of a crime through, all right? First of all, there would be the arraignment. You know, when somebody is accused of a crime, they're taken before a judge. The prosecutor says, here's what they are accused of. Here's what they're guilty of. That's sort of what Paul does right here in these first couple of verses. He asks two questions. First of all, he says, what then? Now, I think his idea is, all right, I've already presented all this evidence to you for two and a half chapters now. What more is there to say, basically, is what he's saying. And then he asked the second question. He said, are we as Jews? And then, you know, he's writing to Jewish Christians. We, they're today called fulfilled Jews, those who have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And he said, are we Jews any better off than anybody else? Now, that was a rhetorical question, but immediately Paul answers this question. He said, no, not at all. We're just as guilty as they are. And I would just say to you, that's kind of true of us as well today. You know, actually, the, for the Jews to hear this uh, was ridiculous to them. They thought by their heritage, by the fact that they were born Jewish, that they had the righteousness of God within them. And Paul was saying, no, you don't. I think a lot of people today think because I was born into a Christian home, I've got Christian parents, I've got Christian grandparents. You know, my daddy was a preacher, my granddaddy was a preacher. Because I go to church, on Easter Sunday morning, that means that I'm right. Oh, everything's good with me. I'm righteous. Paul says, no, you don't have any advantage by yourself and by what you do. You are just as guilty as anybody else. And Paul, right from the start, has been saying, hey, the worst reprobate in the world, the worst sinner, the worst murderer in this world is guilty, and the most seemingly good person in the world is guilty as well. All of us are guilty of sin, Paul's saying. 1 John 5, 19, just remind us the entire unredeemed world lies in the power of the evil one. All of us lie within the power of Satan and Satan's schemes and Satan's temptations within us, and we give in. All of us give in to that. Even as Christians, even as believers in Christ, we still give in from time to time to the temptations that God's brought to us. And Paul says, you're, you're being arraigned now, arraigned for your sinfulness. All right, secondly, there's an indictment. You know, once that arraignment's made, then the judge decides whether or not an indictment will come down. And here in verses 10 through 17 or so, we have Paul's indictment, 13 different counts he's going to bring against us. Now, up until this point, Paul hasn't quoted much from the Old Testament, but right here in these verses, all of this, chapter 10, all the way through verse 17 at least, really verse through, eight, through verse 18, are quotes from the Old Testament, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Isaiah. And Paul is saying, let me show you biblical evidence that you are guilty. Now, how many of you ladies have one of those magnifying makeup mirrors on your counter in the bathroom? All right, you use it to put on, and you know, some of you are lying, you're not raising your hands today. <laughs> My wife's got one, she's had one for years. And hers had a light that went around the, the circle, the outside of the, of the deal, and you push the little button down here and it comes on, and, and it was run by batteries. Well, it stopped working. And finally, after a while, she said, hey, would you switch those batteries out? So I got the thing, turned it over, got the back of it off, started to take the batteries out, and I noticed what you've seen before, that white powdery stuff. You know, that batteries had gotten so old that that stuff was seeping out of them and it was all in there. And so I tried my best to clean it all out. I got four fresh new batteries, popped them in there, put the back on, turn it over, push the button, nothing happened. Time for a new makeup mirror for my wife. So we do what you do. We got on Amazon and we ordered one. And two days later, bam, it came to our house. Now, this one's different. This one doesn't have to have batteries. You just plug it in kind of like you do your, your phone or, or your, your, your watch or whatever, and it charges it up, and it runs for a little while. Now, we'll talk to the guys for a minute. Guys, have you ever looked in one of those magnifying mirrors at yourself? I do not recommend it, all right? <laughs> if you have not, just avoid it. Stay away from it. Because when you look at it, it's not going to magnify what you think are your great features on your face. 
Instead, it's going to magnify the bad things on your face. I mean, that's what those mirrors are for. When a lady looks in there, she sees the things that don't look so good. Now she can fix them and cover them up or whatever and go on. That's what a magnifying mirror does. That's what the Bible does. The Bible doesn't magnify the great things in your life. The Bible magnifies the things that need to be changed in your life. It magnifies those things that need to be forgiven. It magnifies the guilt that needs to be taken out. And that's why Paul right here gives us over and over and over again Scripture. And he tells us, here's the things that need to be changed in your life. Now, if we could break down these verses into three categories, here's what they'd be. First of all, character. Paul talks about our character. He says, none is righteous. And by the way, the word none and no one is found six times in these verses. He's wanting all of us to realize everybody is characterized by these things. He points out our character, none is righteous. That word righteous, just the basic meaning here is being right before God being right before God. He says, nobody is right before God. Now, again, he's talking about inner character here. Let me just kind of bottom line it for you. What Paul is saying is, if you are not as good as God, you are not good enough for God. So let me ask you, anybody uh, live up to that today? Absolutely not. None of us do. And that's what he's trying to point out. We have to be perfect as God is perfect and none of us are. The second category has to do with our conversation, with our, with our tongues, with the things that we say. Would you agree with me that you can learn a lot about a person by just listening to how they talk? You know, you meet somebody new, probably in the first five or 10 minutes, just the language they use, whether it's foul language or not, it's kind language, not, tells you a whole lot about a person. You know, I've told this before, I love to go play golf somewhere when they add somebody into our group that I don't know. And usually about the third or fourth hole, you know, say, well, hey, well, what, is it? what do you do? And I'll say, well, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church and didn't. And sometimes the eyes get about this big around. <laughs> and you can just tell they're thinking in their mind, what was it I said when I missed that putt back there on number two? And, you know, it's just our language tells a lot about us, doesn't it? It tells who we are. It tells what's on the inside. You ever heard everybody say, well, I just don't know where that came from. Well, I'll tell you where it came from. The Bible says it comes out of our hearts. We speak out of our hearts. Listen to what Jesus said about it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. You know, we've come a long ways in this country when it comes to foul language, have we not? 1939, Gone with the Wind came out. How many remember that movie? I know you don't have to raise your hands on that. (laughs) Gone with the Wind. Rhett Butler had a famous line in there. Remember? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a... And you know what he didn't give there. People were aghast. They were astounded that that word was used in a motion picture. Can you imagine what those people would think if they lived today? (laughs) And they just watch regular television much less a movie or something. I mean, we've come a long ways in foul language and and, and conversation. You know, Paul goes on to talk about ways that we use our tongue. We we use it to destroy people, the things we say about people in public or even in private sometimes to destroy them. He also talked about how we deceive. We deceive others with our tongue. Have you realized, you realize you don't have to teach a three-year-old how to lie? (laughs) You don't have to teach them. They already know. You say, well, how? How does a three-year-old know how to lie? They're born with it. We are all born with that sinful nature within. We've got to teach them how to tell the truth because they're not born with that. They're born with the nature to sin and with the nature to lie. And our conversation is a part of that. So he talks about our character, our conversation, finally our conduct. He says our conduct is unbecoming of God as well. Our conduct makes us guilty uh, here on this earth. And that's why Paul says over and again, no one, not one, all of us, all of us are guilty. And so the indictment comes down. This is what we're being accused of. This is what we have done. You know, one of the last things he talks about there uh, towards the end, he talks about feet swift to shed blood. You know, as you look at our world today, I'm told that the 20th century was the most violent century in the history of mankind. Arnold Barnett is a professor at MIT. He's done some research. I was astounded when I heard this. He said, a child born today in one of the 50 largest cities in America. All right, so think about that. 
That would include Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, San Antonio, Houston, many others. 50 largest cities in our country. A child born today in that city has a 1 in 50 chance of being murdered here on this in the United States of America. A child has more chance of being murdered today than a soldier in World War II had of being killed in combat. And that is in the Christian nation of the United States of America. Folks, that's where we are in our world today. Those who are telling you, trying to tell you the world's getting better and better, uh, they have their eyes closed. The world is getting worse and worse. And it's because of my sin, it's because of your sin that that's happening. So he brings down that, uh, that indictment. All right, third thing we see here is the motive. And the motive is found there in verse 18. Look at it again. What Paul quoted, he's quoting from Psalms, and Paul says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that's from Psalm 36 and verse 1. Let me quote the whole verse to you, or read the whole verse to you out of Psalms. He says, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. All right, transgression, sin, speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Now, when we talk about fear of God, there's a positive fear of God, and there's what I would call a negative fear of God. The positive fear of God is for us as believers, for us as Christians, to have a reverential, if you will, fear of God, an acknowledgement of his holiness, an acknowledgement of his greatness, an acknowledgement of his righteousness, where we realize Yes, that's who he is. Now, the negative fear would be for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and it's a terror. It's a holy terror of what is going to happen if I don't come to know Christ as my Savior and Lord. That's the cause of all of this. There's no fear of God anymore. You know, growing up, my dad, my dad's only five foot five. And so by the time I got to be in about the eighth grade, I was taller than him. Certainly by the time I was in ninth grade and 10th grade, I was much stronger than him. There was no doubt that I was physically bigger and stronger with him. But you know what? Even as a ninth and 10th grader, 11th and 12th grader, I had a fear of my dad. It wasn't a cowering fear. I didn't think he was going to hurt me. I didn't think he was going to destroy me by any way, certainly not physically. But I had a holy fear of my dad, a love for my dad a reverence, a respect for my dad because of who he was and because of what he was doing to shape me into the man uh, that God wanted me to be. That's the kind of fear we're talking about we need to have of God, a respect, uh, an awe of who he is. But be very sure, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you better have that other kind of fear as well because exactly what the Bible says is going to happen and will happen. You look at the Old Testament and you see it happening where God brought punishment upon people who disobeyed him. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Those cities were wiped out because of sinfulness. And remember Lot's wife? Lot's wife was fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah behind her. God had said, do not look back. You remember what she did? She turned to look back and she became a pillar of salt. Some say, well, she became salt because she looked back? No, she became salt because she was disobedient to God. God had told her not to do something. And how about the flood? God wiped out everybody on this earth, save for eight people, all because of sin. I promise you, God will punish sin. We need to have that fear of God. And that fear of God hopefully keeps us from sin. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. That's how we hopefully avoid sin and get out of sin is by having that fear of God. So arraignment, indictment, motive. Let's just get to the verdict now. The last one, the verdict. The verdict is very simple. Verses 19 and 20 have the verdict. Basically, there's no defense. There's no grounds for acquittal. There's no way we can get out of it. And there in verses 19 and 20, Paul talks about the law. Just in case somebody thought, you know, I can follow the law and that will get me to heaven. Remember the rich young ruler? That's what he thought. He thought, I'll follow the law. Remember what Jesus said to him? If you want to go to heaven, follow all the commandments. Remember what he said? I followed all of them since my birth. If I was Jesus, I would have gotten over here out of the way so that the lightning didn't hit me when it hit him. I mean, we know that guy didn't follow them all, but that's just kind of how he was. I followed them all. Well, Paul's just reminding us, nobody, none of us have followed them all. We are all guilty. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now at this point in the message. You're thinking, I came to Easter Sunday morning to hear this? to hear how sorry I am, to hear how sinful I am, welcome to reality, because we all are. We are all guilty before God, 
We are all guilty of sin, and we are all headed to that verdict of sinfulness and unforgiveness and an eternity separated from God in hell for all of eternity. So, enjoy your ham and your Easter egg hunts as you celebrate Easter. Oh, there is one more thing that I would, uh, that I would kind of put in there. Uh, let's talk about the pardon. Let's talk about what Easter is all about. Because you see, while you're guilty of sin and I'm guilty of sin, thankfully, Easter came. And Easter changed it all. So stand with me again in honor of God's Word. Let's read about Easter now. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, tells us what happened on that first Easter Sunday morning. It tells us about the pardon. You see, you're guilty. I'm guilty. But thankfully, there's a pardon involved. Let's read about it. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the men, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Can anybody say amen to that? As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to go to Galilee and there they will see me. You may be seated. You see, because of Easter, everything changed. Now, if you still got your Bible open there to Romans chapter three, look at verse 21. Look at the first word of verse 21. It's very small, just three letters, but B-U-T, just one T, B-U-T. R.C. Sproul says that's his favorite word in all of the New Testament. And he says that because those three letters, B-U-T, make all the difference in the world. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between life and death. It's the difference between shame and guilt and forgiveness and eternal life. You see, because of Easter, there is a pardon. There's an opportunity for you to be forgiven of your sin, to have that guilt removed, and have Jesus Christ come in and make a difference in your life. You know, it's H.B. London that said, in a devotional I read this morning, it said, Pastor, and this is a devotional for pastors, it said, Pastor, 40% of the people who will be in your Easter services today have not truly made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I thought that was kind of interesting. 40%. Now, maybe you're part of that 40%. Oh, you've come to church every Easter for the last X number of years. Uh, You know the story. You've heard it read. But you never really made it personal in your life. You know, like Chloe, who was baptized this morning. You've never let Jesus Christ really come into your life to confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We want you to have the opportunity to do that this Easter Sunday morning. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes all over the room. I just wanna ask you that question today. You just ask it of yourself. Has there been a time in your life when you truly believed in your heart that Jesus died on that cross for your sin because of your guilt and you've let him come in and forgive you of that sin? and become your Savior and Lord. In just a moment, we're going to stand. Our praise team is coming up. They're going to lead us in a song. And today, if you've never made that decision, you've never taken that step, I'm going to challenge you to make your way out of the aisle, or out of the the pew there, into the aisle, down here to the front. Our pastors are going to be here at the front. And we'd love to help you to take that step of faith, to let Jesus Christ become your Savior and your Lord. Not just somebody you think about on Easter, with somebody personal in your life. And today you can confess them with your mouth 
and believe in your heart. I'm going to challenge you to do that today. Don't be part of that 40% that have never taken that step. Today, you can do it. Today, you can let Jesus Christ be your Savior and Lord. Take away your sin and your guilt. Father, thank you. Thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, died on that cross and was resurrected on that first Easter so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have a relationship with you. And Father, I pray for those in this room, maybe some watching online today, that haven't taken that step, they haven't believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth, I pray that today they would do so. So we give you this time of invitation. I ask you to speak to our hearts. Help us to be obedient to you. Give us courage today, Father, to step out for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me right now, all over this room. As we sing this song today, if God's spoken to your heart and you're ready to take that step, I invite you to come talk to one of our pastors. We'd love to help you to take that step today on this Easter Sunday. So as we sing, God's spoken to you. Don't wait. Come right now. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glory.
outside this door is our guest reception area. Some of our pastors will be there. They would love to talk to you at that time. Going to be seated right now. We're going to have a, a child dedication today. And joining me here this morning is uh, Rowan Hadley. Uh, he was born on October the 2nd, 2023. So he's about five months old. And his parents are here with him, Reed and Caitlin. And his uh, brother, uh, Rhett, is here. And his sister, Riverland, is here as well. And so we're glad to have all of them here today. So we've got a couple things we want to give them. First of all, certificate reminding you of this special day uh, when Rowan was dedicated to the Lord. A uh, letter to Rowan, hopefully you'll give him on his 12th birthday, reminding him of this day. And then this book, uh, Hope for Each Day, 365 Devotionals for Kids. And uh, we hope you'll use this in teaching all three of your kids about God's love for him. Now they've got family here as well. Larry and Shauna Brewer and Charlie Hadley are here. They're right over here with the camera in front of us uh, getting all this recorded. <laughs> So uh, good to have them here today as well. Let me ask our church family, if you'll do all you can to help this family in raising all three of these children to love God and to honor Him. If you'll do that, would you say amen? amen. And let me ask Reed and Caitlin, if you'll do all you can to lead your children to love God and to follow Him. Will you do that? All right. It seems like just a few days ago I was doing their wedding, and now we're doing dedication for a third child up here. <laughs> And uh, so that's great. So let's bow in prayer and have a prayer of dedication today. Father, we thank you so much for the joy of children and the blessing they are in our lives. I thank you for Rowan today. Thank you for the special young man that he is. Thank you for blessing him by placing him in this family where he's going to learn about you and about your, his love for you, your love for him, Father. And we pray that when he's old enough, he'll invite you into his life to be a Savior, Lord. And until then, we pray that he would grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, like your son Jesus Christ did here on this earth. So, Father, I pray your blessings on this family. Thank you so much for a church that will help them uh, in raising them to love you and to follow them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give them a hand this morning. All right. You want me? Can you carry it? All right. We have about three reminders I want to remind you about coming up. First of all, tomorrow night in this very room at 7 p.m., we have our guided prayer time. We've already had one. This is our second one coming up. We encourage you to come for that guided prayer time tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Also, ladies, we have Lunch Bunch. That'll be just around the corner a week from this coming Tuesday on April the 9th. Encourage you to go online and sign up for that so they'll know how many are coming and prepare a lunch for you. So make sure you ladies go online and sign up for Lunch Munch. It'll be here before you know it. And then also, if you're a guest or you want to find out more information about what it takes to be a member here at First Baptist Church and how you can be involved, we have a thing called Discover First. And that's going to be April the 21st. And uh, it'll be on a Sunday during our 930 service. We encourage you to go online to sign up for Discover First. You can find out about events and ministries and what it takes to be a member here at First Baptist Church. So lots of great things going on. We encourage you just to check those out online and uh, just to see how you can be involved in ministries here at First Baptist Church. It's been a great day, hasn't it? Amen. Would you stand with me and let's close in prayer. God, we love you. <clears throat> and we praise you and thank you that we can come together as a church family and just worship you and praise you for you are our living Savior. You live within us and you have given us a hope and a future and you have just blessed us with so many blessings. We come today just to thank you and praise you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for this time of Bible study. May you just plant your word in our heart through these songs and through the study of your word so that we'll be stronger as we go out from this place. We love you. We praise you in the strong name of Jesus, we pray.